My name's David Chocanel, I'm the Director of the Institute and uh, before we get going I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I, I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to life, uh, to the life of this city and the region more generally. We'd also like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be attending the seminar today. Um, this is an Institute for Applied Ecology <laughs> seminar. We, uh, it's also a, 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 a 100 year centenary of Canberra seminar. We decided that um, we'd like to contribute to the 100 year centenary program, uh, recognising the fact that, um, that Canberra's always been a real epicentre for science in, in Australia generally and, uh, and environmental science specifically. Uh, I was a master's student at this August Institute and I remember regularly ferrying around between ANU, uh, uh, UC or CCAE as it was in those days and uh, wildlife ecology out at Gungahl and attending uh, seminars every other day it felt like at the time. Uh, and I think that tradition sort of continues today so I guess acknowledging that from the IAE perspective we thought we'd like to set aside a few of our uh, regular seminars, uh, our regular weekly seminars uh, for special speakers talking about special topics and, and, and attach those to the centenary program. So that's what we've done. Uh, so this is the uh, first of three centenary seminars we'll be hosting this year. The other two are later in the year, uh, on uh, Tuesday the 20th of August and uh, Tuesday the 17th of September. And uh, just uh, keep, keep your eye on the bulletin board or our website for the details of those. Uh, we're going to hold you in suspense about who we're delivering those, but the details will emerge in due course. Um, now I'd like to invite um, a, uh, one of the, uh, the thinkers in residence that the Institute enjoys um, uh, the company of, uh, Jenny Marshall-Graves, to come and introduce uh, Scott Edwards, our speaker today. Well, thank you, Dave. It's a huge pleasure to welcome Scott Edwards back here. Um, I first met Scott when he was a bright young assistant professor <laughs> in Seattle at the University of Washington when I was there on sabbatical many years ago, and um, he got me all excited about third major histocompatibility compatibility locus. Um, and his interests have broad from the one locus of whole genome, and from birds to all non-mammal reptiles. Um, and my interests have now included the MHC locus to you here. Uh, now Scott's been a wonderful collaborator and a real inspiration, and since he's moved to Harvard, he has uh, hooked up with many, many groups around the world. So we've been very, very fortunate at UC to be able to work with him on an ongoing basis. So thank you, Scott. I'm glad you're here. And Scott's talking about answering all questions with the new genomics and evolutionary biology. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, it's great to be here in Canberra. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, David, for being such great hosts. And I also like to thank uh, Tariq Azaz. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, and um, I have to say, over the years, that uh, Canberra has really emerged uh, as a sort of a second home for me. Um, it's obviously uh, a, a tough moment right now with the, the horrible news uh, from Boston. Um, you know, not to begin the seminar on a, a dour note, but uh, I have to say, on several occasions, uh, it's, I've been in Australia uh, when you know, sort of tragedy has struck. This happened to my family and I when 9-11 struck. We were in Canberra at the time, and uh, here it's happened again. And so I just, uh, we, we have an enormous uh, feeling of, uh, of safety and, and welcoming when we're here. Of course, there are problems all over the world, but uh, I really believe that uh, Australia and Canberra is a wonderful place. And so thank you for, uh, for taking me into uh, to your family. Um, and uh, today, I'll, I'd like to tell you about uh, some of our uh, research uh, from Harvard. Uh, evolutionary biology, like most uh, biological sciences, is being transformed by genomics. And my hope today is to kind of um, uh, try to illustrate how uh, genomics is not only sort of just giving us more data to answer questions, but it's kind of changing the way we look at uh, evolutionary processes. So I hope that comes through in the seminar. Now, um, this is just a slide that some of my old friends here, I'm sure, have seen, but I think it illustrates 
just the long association I've had with Australia. I did my dissertation uh, studying uh, great crown babblers all up around the top end in Western Australia. And um, you can see from this uh, graph that, uh, this map that uh, as um, the years have gone on, as my own family group has gotten larger, my, my trips have gotten shorter. So it's, a, it's always a, a balance between the home and family and, and field work. And of course now, um, my trips are primarily uh, academic, administrative, not much field work. Uh, when I moved to, uh, to Harvard, it became clear that it was going to be difficult to uh, come halfway around the world uh, every year to, to do field work. But nonetheless, it's great to uh, keep these associations going. Now, um, my lab uh, studies many different uh, topics in evolution. And uh, what you see here are sort of four of the main areas of interest. Uh, so uh, phylogeography, uh, Australia turns out to be a great place to study phylogeography. The uh, geographic patterns uh, that you have here, the very um, uh, strong ecological gradients from uh, rainforest to desert, all of these combine to make it a, a great place to uh, study geographic patterns. Um, we also have uh, a, a research program in what you might call ecological genomics. And this uh, is primarily our work on uh, a host pathogen system involving uh, house finches, which is our, our common songbird in North America, and a uh, bacterial pathogen called a mycoplasma. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit of that uh, today. Uh, we also, as Jenny mentioned, we do quite a bit with comparative genomics. We're quite interested in what we can learn by lining genomes up to each other and, and looking at the patterns there. And we've also done a little bit of theory. How do we uh, reconstruct evolutionary history from these uh, data sets? And so my current lab group, you can see here, um, and uh, it's delightful to, to say that some of these have, are, are continuing to carry the Aussie torch and are uh, um, continuing research here. In particular, um, Maud Baldwin, whom you see, I don't, do I have a pointer here? I don't know if there's a laser. Um, She's a second from the uh, left there, and uh, she actually just uh, returned from Australia. She has, she's very interested in the evolution of uh, sweet taste perception in birds. So how, how do nectar rivers birds uh, detect sugar? Very interesting story involving uh, the molecular evolution of taste receptors. She has to actually go to the places where she gets the birds because she needs fresh tongues for her research. So she was uh, over here uh, harassing all manner of uh, parrots and honey eaters. Uh, and uh, anyway, it's, uh, she really uh, has, uh, has a really interesting findings there. Um, and what you can see here is uh, here we are in the uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology, which is uh, where the ornithology collection is, and, uh, which is under my, my care. And we've just got a great uh, staff. And um, as I'll mention in just a few moments, we're under a big uh, move actually to sort of uh, dust off the collection and put it into new housing. Now the reason I'm in Canberra this trip for such a short trip is that my main purpose is actually further north. And uh, this is where I'll be uh, actually starting tomorrow. Uh, I'll fly to Brisbane and then up to Port Moresby. Uh, and I just heard Leo Joseph, my, my colleague here from Canberra who's here in the audience, uh, has just returned from New Guinea. And so those of you who've been to New Guinea, I think appreciate just how spectacular a place it is uh, biologically. I haven't been there since my uh, dissertation. And so uh, anyway, I'm really looking forward to that. Now in addition to this being the uh, centenary of Canberra, uh, the biogeographers in the audience will also know that this is an important uh, centenary. And of course, I'm talking about uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, here he is, and here, of course, is his famous Wallace's line, which uh, he, he was the first to notice the strong distinction between Asian and uh, Australian uh, faunas. And so um, this is a, a great year uh, for Wallace. Um, many societies uh, around the world will be celebrating his centenary, um, and he will be the theme of this year's uh, evolution meetings uh, in uh, North America, they'll be in Utah this summer, and uh, if you go to the, the website for those meetings, you'll see a big uh, picture of Wallace. I think 
It's a strange picture, but if you look at it, I think they're trying to make it seem as if he's one of the faces in Mount Rushmore, which is that famous uh, <laughs> stone uh, pa you know, panel of different presidents. Of course, he, he deserves, although he's not as remembered as Darwin, he certainly deserves uh, presidential status. Uh, so what I'd like to tell you about today are really just three stories uh, from uh, recent work from our lab. And uh, basically, uh, they're interconnected insofar as they're all um, using uh, next generation approaches in different ways. And uh, we'll first begin in uh, South America, actually. And this is work by a postdoc named Frank Reint, who uh, is actually now an um, assistant professor at the uh, National uh, University of Singapore. And so he's, um, he's, uh, he's uh, in, in, the, uh, in the neighborhood, as it were. Um, and then we'll uh, sort of transition and talk a little bit about um, some of the interesting genomic patterns that we uncover when we look at the transcriptome. The transcriptome being the set of genes that are transcribed and expressed in a given organism in a given environment. And then we'll end by talking about uh, the uh, host pathogen system that I mentioned to you. There's the house finch up on the top there. Um, and I'll tell you some about some of the uh, interesting ways in which we're trying to look for evidence of natural selection on the genome of house finches as uh, delivered, as influenced by this uh, bacterial pathogen, this uh, mycoplasma. Now, when I first moved to Harvard, it was funny. You know, Harvard does a very good job of uh, just sort of uh, the media industry there, the media machine is just out of control. They sort of announce every new faculty arrival with great fanfare. But I have to say that when they covered my arrival, I was a little put off by the way they, they their headline. What you can see here is, uh, they said, Edward studies birds with genetic databases, not binoculars. That sort of rankled me a little bit. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a card-carrying field biologist. You know, I, it's not like I've, you know, jettisoned my binoculars for genetic databases. Anyway, um, it's, uh, it's uh, been a very interesting uh, journey trying to unite uh, natural history on the one hand and, and genomics and databases on the other. What you can see here is the uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Um, up on the t upper left are its humble origins in 1859 when it was founded by Louis Agassiz. And uh, now, uh, the, after being in this brick building, uh, the, after being in the brick building for the last 150 years, many of the collections will be moving to a new facility right next door in the basement of this modern building, which is uh, the Northwest Lab. And this is a very exciting uh, time for the collections. Um, we're dusting off the collections, finding all kinds of stuff that we didn't know we had. And so um, uh, in uh, starting very soon, uh, these collections will start to move. And probably within about uh, nine months to a year, they'll all be uh, safely housed in the uh, basement of the Northwest Lab. And this is what you can see on the top is just a sort of a pre move view of our new facilities there. It's really very exciting. The bird collection is the fifth largest collection in the world, and so it's got a really large number of very old, historically very valuable specimens. Um, you, we have both uh, traditional specimens as well as um, a small but growing uh, genetic resources collection. So if you do stop by, uh, just, uh, we'd love to show you around and show you uh, our new facilities for the collections. So let's start and talk about South American birds. Again, this is work by uh, Frank Reint. And uh, you know, Frank is one of these sort of global citizens of the world. You could plunk him down in any rainforest on the planet. And not only would he know all the birds there, that's sort of a given, but he would also know the local language. He's from Germany, but he knows lots of different languages. Uh, his wife is Malaysian, and so they'll be perfectly at home in, the, in Singapore. Anyway, Frank's uh, also, he has this penchant for picking the most drab, hard to identify species on the planet to work with. And so uh, that's what these are. These are uh, 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 flycatchers in the genus Zimmerius. And despite their uh, sort of drabness, I hope to show you that they've really got a lot of interesting things going on with their genes when we look at them. <clears throat> 
Now for Frank's uh, dissertation work, he studied, uh, which actually was conducted here in Australia, he got his degree from the University of Melbourne. Um, he was interested in this group from the point of view of phylogenetics and he conducted uh, studies with uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is a commonly used tool for uh, phylogenetics. And you can see various different relationships that he uh, discovered. And as a result of this work, he was able to uh, uncover a very interesting um, system in which a mosaic population, which you see there in purple, has characteristics of a population to the north called Zemerius chrysops, as well as a population to the south called Zemerius viridiflavus. His mitochondrial studies had suggested the relationships that you see here between the mosaic population viridiflavus and the uh, uh, chrysops population up north. But of course, we all know that mitochondrial DNA is just one view of what can be happening in the genome. And so we wanted to use um, uh, new approaches to look at the pattern of relationships genome-wide. It's worth mentioning that this population, the mosaic population is mosaic because in terms of its vocalizations, it matches this southern population, Viridiflavus. You can see the sonograms there. But in terms of its plumage, it matches the northern population, Chrysops. And so this is a very interesting setting to look at the relationships of this enigmatic mosaic population. So enter next generation sequencing. Um, many of you have perhaps heard of this uh, a new approach that's become available recently. We in the northern hemisphere call it uh, rad tags. I think uh, other folks around the world tend to call it genotyping by sequencing or lots of different uh, phrases for this. Um, it's an interesting approach in which we cut the DNA with restriction enzymes and then um, basically try to select a, a subset of the genome of a bunch of individuals, sort of a homologous set of fragments that we can then sequence and compare uh, to each other. Now, um, our samples in terms of individuals were quite small, and I, I will, I'll digress for a moment to try to justify this very limited sampling in terms of numbers. But for the time being, let me just briefly tell you about this technique. Uh, the Zemerius genome, like other birds, is probably about one gigabase or uh, one and a half gigabases, and we wanted to kind of simplify it by choosing a subset of the fragments in that genome. So you can see here in the red square, we've sliced out a particular subset of fragments and then we'll um, modify those so that we can sequence them on the Illumina platform. <clears throat> now, um, in thinking about this issue of sampling in genomics, what we're beginning to learn is that what we might uh, lose if, in terms of uh, small numbers of actual individuals that we look at in a population study or a phylogenetic study we can actually make up for many times over by looking at lots and lots of genes. And this is one way, I think, in which genomics is changing our view of um, what populations look like, what species look like. So for example, in a diploid individual, we, can, we have two chromosomes. <clears throat> and for any position along our genome, we can count the number of differences we see between those two chromosomes in that region. It might be 10 differences, it might be zero differences, but we can look across that, we can look at that statistic not only in one region, but across the entire genome. <clears throat> and it turns out that this simple number, this, the number of differences between two chromosomes uh, for a given region, turns out to be a very, uh, gives you a, a, an insight into the size of the population from which those regions emerged. When you have lots of differences, that means at some point the population was very big. When you have very few differences, that likely means that, that, that at some point in the history that uh, population was small. And by looking at the distribution of these distances across the whole genome, even from a single diploid individual, we can begin to make broad statements about population history. And this was the insight of uh, Lee and Durbin here who took single genomes, single diploid genomes, and counted the number of differences in different chromosomal fragments. So what you can see here are six individuals. Uh, the top two are from the Yorobas in Africa, 
you can see some Europeans, there's a Korean and a Chinese individual. And on the uh, y-axis, we see an estimate of the effective population size, sort of the, the size of the breeding population. And on the x-axis, you can see a, uh, basically a time slice. This is in years. Um, with more recent times uh, on the left and more ancient times on the, on the right. And what's intriguing about this is from a single individuals, we can reconstruct these broad patterns in human history where we have uh, dips and troughs in population sizes that are actually shared by most human races. You can see that on the left side, on the right side of the plot. Whereas in more recent times, uh, different human groups have expanded and, and of course the human species as a whole has expanded dramatically in size. <clears throat> All of this information is encoded in these different segments in, along our chromosomes. And so all of this is to sort of say that um, there are sort of complementary insights that we can get from looking at lots of individuals, say for one gene like mitochondrial DNA, versus very few number of individuals for many, many different genes. And so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out um, in phylogeography generally. So just continuing on the rad tags, uh, here you can see just some of our quality scores. Uh, in general, we got very good quality. On the right here, you can see the number of sequence reads, um, large numbers of sequence reads for, per individual. You can see the three groups, the mosaic group in blue and the uh, northern and southern groups. And so um, we're all set to begin an analysis. And this is generally what our data looked like. Across the sample as a whole, we got just a little bit over 100,000 different SNPs. And so this, this, this method is designed to give us single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, depending on how we want to count those, we are dealing with data sets on the order of 10,000 or the main data set that I'll use in which the SNPs were present in every lineage is, every lineage is about 2,000 SNPs, which is an extraordinary number considering where we've come from in recent years, looking at just a handful of nuclear genes. So if we look at the, uh, across the data set, you can see this is a simple plot showing sort of the genomic makeup of each of the 12 individuals in this study. And what you can clearly see is that the mosaic birds are very much genomically aligned with the, the southern birds, okay? So this is uh, the vast majority of the genomes of the five, uh, I'm sorry, the four mosaic birds that you see there are almost entirely affiliated with the southern group. And so this is a nice, it's actually a confirmation of some of the work that uh, Frank did for his dissertation. And you can also see in this plot of uh, FST, FST is simply a measure of uh, allele frequency differences between populations. You can see that the differentiation between the mosaic birds and the southern birds is, is virtually nil. They're very, very similar, whereas there's quite substantial differentiation for these other comparisons. So what this is telling us is that, in fact, the vocalizations are giving us a better clue to the genomic affinities than is the plumage, which is quite interesting because in birds anyway, vocalizations tend to evolve extremely quickly, kind of like human languages. And in many cases, they've turned out to provide very little phylogenetic information. These flycatchers, of course, uh, they're not learning their song like many of the songbirds here in Australia. They're part of a group of uh, passerine birds called sub that are actually born with their song. And so it might make sense that their vo vocalizations would be a better guide to, uh, to their relationships. So what you can see uh, on the left is just a principal component plots, again, showing that the mosaic birds are very allied with the southern uh, Viridiflavus birds. And uh, you can also see on the right a uh, comparison of the vocalization, sort of a quantification of the vocalizations, again, showing how the mosaic and southern birds are similar. So this is all making good sense. <clears throat> now, we can put this in a sort of a phylogenetic context, although, uh, again, with this type of data, it causes us to sort of rethink our traditional ways of, of making trees. Remember, this data set essentially consists of single nucleotides that are either scored as a homozygote or heterozygote in, across many, many sites across the genome of these birds. So we used a new method called SNAP, which is specifically designed to analyze these single nucleotide traits. 
Most of phylogenetics, uh, as many of you know, we're used to dealing with long strings of nucleotides that we can make trees with confidently. And yet, with the rad tags, we're coming up with a very different type of data. Now we've got not strings of nucleotides that are all linked together, but single nucleotides spread out across the genome. How are we going to analyze this? <clears throat> we're going to use a method that actually capitalizes on our ability to score genotypes in across many different individuals. So what you can see here are the three groups, uh, this, this, the northern, the mosaic, and the southern group. We've scored them for, um, I think this is a data set of about 1,500 of these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we're scoring each individual as either a homozygote or a, or a heterozygote for uh, a given SNP. Again, very different data than we're used to dealing with. I won't go through the details of this method except to say that it's a really intriguing way to sort of uh, translate these genotype uh, frequencies within species and between species and translate that into a uh, estimate of, of phylogeny, which you can see right here. This is our estimate of the relationships of the uh, mosaic birds and the southern uh, viridiflavus and the northern chrysops with uh, two outgroup species. And you can see that this is sort of a cloud of relationships, which is exactly what we would expect for when we look across the genome. We get sort of a statistical average of many different places. But this, of course, confirms the earlier results that I showed you, uh, in which mosaic birds are very similar to the southern uh, viridiflavus birds. Now, despite this very clear association of the mosaic birds, we wanted to ask the question, where is, is there any evidence for gene flow between any of these species? You know, just because we can make a tree of, of, of different populations doesn't mean that these are populations that aren't actually exchanging genes with each other. And it's also the case that in many uh, different uh, animal and, and plant systems in recent years, lots of people are finding evidence for sort of cryptic introgression, movement of genes between species. And of course, our own species is thought to have experienced introgression from Neanderthal ancestors. And so uh, introgression is very much thought to be a part, although I, there's, I'm sure there's controversy with some of the details. Uh, introgression seems to be emerging as a very important component of human evolution. So what can we say about introgression in this system? Well, we're going to conduct a test that will allow us to distinguish two different causes of sort of shared polymorphisms between species. All of this, all of these, uh, this sort of complex of these three uh, lineages are closely related enough that they are, they're, they're, they share a lot of polymorphisms from a common ancestor. So how can we distinguish whether that, those polymorphisms are due to simple recent ancestry, where the variants are still sorting out, or whether some of those shared polymorphisms are due to cryptic introgression. Well, we're going we're to perform a test called the ABBA-BABA test. It's a fun thing for a big uh, room full of people to say all together, ABBA-BABA, say it all together. Anyway, it's a very interesting test that was first developed in the context of Neanderthal genomics. And the test works like this. Basically, we're going to ask whether these two patterns in the genome, where uh, whether when we look at a SNP, is that SNP shared between the mosaic and the chrysops population? Or is that SNP shared between the chrysops and the viridiflavus population? We can ask that of, of any SNP that we uncover in our survey. Now, the prediction, if all of these polymorphisms are shared as the result of recent ancestry, we predict these two numbers to be equal, OK? unless selection or something is moving things around. But under neutrality, they should all be equal. However, if we've got gene flow going on between uh, one of these groups, that's going to offset uh, one of these patterns, depending on which species is experiencing gene flow with, uh, in this case, uh, Zimmerius chrysops, the northern species. So again, just to illustrate that, here's a case where we have AGGA and this pattern we expect to encounter frequently because we've got shared polymorphisms, or what in more recent parlance we call incomplete lineage sorting. 
By contrast, we might find a pattern that is the Baba pattern, or where the Gs are shared by the southern and northern species to the exclusion of the mosaic population. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to count up the frequencies of these two patterns across the genome. And what we find is that we find a slight excess of ABBA patterns, which you see here on the upper right, relative to BABA patterns. This difference is too great to be explained just by random fluctuation. And what this suggests is that, in fact, we have evidence for cryptic gene flow between Chrysops, the northern species, and the mosaic population, despite the fact that it's the mosaic population and the southern species that are genomically most closely related. So this is a really exciting situation where we're able to pick up, sort of detect this very weak signal for introgression that's going in the opposite direction as the main genomic affinities of this mosaic population. We can do a statistical test on this D statistic and we can show that we've got a clear signal of gene flow. And this is exactly the same logic that folks studying the Neanderthals used to suggest that Europeans had experienced gene flow from uh, Neanderthals. So this is intriguing and I think illustrates, um, you know, the ways in which we can play genomic data off of each other. Now what we've done is to take this, uh, these ABBA patterns and to ask whether or not the genes that these SNPs occur in, at least as uh, indicated by the zebra finch genome, which is the main songbird genome that we have access to, do the genes that in which these ABBA, uh, these, uh, the genes that are flowing between these species, do they reside in a particular group of genes that are enriched for certain biological functions? This is a very easy thing to do bioinformatically. These are called GO terms or gene ontology terms. They're sort of a poor man's biochemistry. I know that folks like Jenny who have, you know, basically started the whole field of, of molecular biology, look at this and they say, you guys have it so easy. You know, you can find a gene function just by punching a button on a computer. We, it used to take 10 years to find out the function of all of these. Anyway, um, what we find is that we actually do have some intriguing signals for the ABBA uh, genes, the, 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 the genes that these ABBA SNPs are linked to, to be enriched for certain gene functions, such as you see here, cell projection, membranes, neuronal projections, et cetera. Whether or not this is actually going to improve our understanding of the system is not at all clear. Um, I think this is a case where we have these really amazing resources. We can at least get a, a suggestion for gene function. But uh, whether or not these actually relate to the uh, similarities of plumage or vocalizations that we're seeing is, is not yet clear. Another thing we can do is to look at where we find these SNPs around the chromosome. And what you can see is that in red, we have the ABBA type uh, genes. Again, these are the genes that are experiencing gene flow between the mosaic and northern populations. Those are in red and then the, the other set in blue. And in general, we find them distributed all over the, the, the genome on pretty much every chromosome. We find a, a, a significantly uh, lower representation of these uh, SNPs on the Z chromosome, the Z chromosome. And so this is uh, intriguing and could represent some sort of uh, reproductive isolation for this chromosome. So uh, I hope this uh, flycatcher pattern coming from, you know, a very obscure group of birds in South America illustrates some of the interesting ways we can use uh, genomic technologies to tease out some of the processes that we really couldn't tell if we were just looking at the phenotype. Now, I want to transition to talk a little bit about our house finch system. And uh, for some of you, I talked a bit about this last year, and I'll just briefly bring you up to speed on what we're learning in this system. This is a great system for studying the interaction between uh, pathogens on the one hand and hosts on the other. And so it's a system for which we have a lot of useful resources, both in terms of museum specimens of the birds, uh, as well as uh, sort of uh, samples through time of the pathogen itself. So what you can see here are some of the um, uh, museum uh, genetic resources that we have for house finches from before this disease uh, uh, jumped from poultry, where, which is its usual host, to uh, house finches. That jump between hosts took place in the mid-1990s, uh, starting in a location in the mid-Atlantic uh, states. 
So this, the tissues that we have, which are primarily in the uh, Royal Ontario Museum in Canada, provide a really nice snapshot of these birds before the disease hit. So we've also been able to look at uh, populations that have been exposed to the pathogen for a number of years. This is the situation in 2001. And moving forward to 2007, we're now in a position where basically all the entire country is covered with this mycoplasma. There's only a few areas in the southwest that are free of this pathogen. So a number of very talented postdocs have done uh, gene expression studies, um, looking at uh, patterns of differentiation between different populations. Um, I'll just briefly share with you some of the insights we've gotten from our gene expression work. Uh, this is, I mentioned this last year, uh, but I think a little bit of repetition is probably okay. Uh, for example, these green bars indicate the relative expression of key genes in the immune system for birds that have not been infected at all. So these are simply comparing the, the baseline levels of expression of these genes between uh, Arizona birds and Alabama birds, Arizona birds being the birds that haven't yet seen the pathogen in nature. So you can see there's some intriguing differences in, in uh, these two populations for these genes. And yet when we infect the birds, experimentally infect the birds with the pathogen, we see a very different situation where the relative level of expression of genes from the Arizona birds shoots down. Uh, in many cases, these, this pathogen seems to be shutting off gene expression of these key immune genes. So this is very intriguing, and uh, it suggests that there may have been uh, microevolution in the Alabama birds that allow them to sort of sustain uh, normal levels of gene expression in the face of this uh, pathogen. So we've done, uh, this is work mostly done by Camille Bernard, a very talented uh, postdoc who's now uh, in England. And um, we look, used a microarray approach to, to generate many of these patterns. Now what we've moved on to uh, in recent years is to try to get a broad view of the uh, diversity of genes in the um, house finch uh, spleen in particular uh, by conducting uh, transcriptome studies. And so a transcriptome is sort of a, a survey of the entire battery of transcripts uh, from a given tissue uh, of a bird in a given uh, physiological uh, state. And we were able to collect a large number of these transcripts. And what you see here is basically a, a sort of a proof of, of, of concept in which we've lined up all of our uh, house finch transcripts, again, uh, from the spleen to transcripts from the zebra finch, which is the other uh, bird whose genome and transcripts have been determined, and compared these with uh, uh, sort of the model uh, bird lineage uh, in uh, biosciences, the game birds, uh, chickens and turkeys. So this was nice because this was actually the first time that we could sort of compare songbirds as a group, albeit with just two species, and uh, game birds as a group. And what we learned, we learned two things sort of about the molecular evolution of genes in these two groups. The first is that the rate of amino acid change, again, looking across many thousands of genes uh, sampled from the spleen, appears to be somewhat bigger in the songbirds than in the game birds. And you can see that by this bar here, which is registering the ratio of the sort of non-synonymous amino acid changing substitutions to the uh, sort of silent substitutions that don't uh, change the, the protein sequence. Now it's not, a huge, it's not a huge jump, but averaged over many, many thousands of genes, this is definitely a significant trend. And in fact, other studies have found a similar uh, change in direction. Now another intriguing thing that we found, which you can see here on this uh, tree, is that the GC content of songbird genes appears to be somewhat higher than what we typically see in uh, game birds. Now the GC content is simply a raw count of the number of Gs and Cs in a genome. And you may be asking yourself, well, who really cares about the GC content? What does it mean 
uh, in terms of how the genome evolves or the ecology of the organisms. And what we're learning is that GC content actually has some really interesting links with the life history of uh, different groups of animals. So GC content is related to a number of genomic features that, um, that uh, genomicists study. And so, for example, isochores are these big waves of uh, high GC and low GC regions around the genome. Um, we also know that uh, GC content can be very um, uh, influenced very strongly by this uh, molecular process called bias gene conversion, which we can think of basically as uh, recombination. It turns out that uh, when recombination occurs, it sort of leaves in its wake uh, a bias towards G's and C's, uh, a slight bias, but a bias nonetheless. So lineages that appear to have higher GC content one can infer, although it's not the only interpretation, that they may have regions of their genome that have higher recombination um, uh, that are driving it in that sense. Now, as I'll show you on the next slide, the rate at which this process occurs is also dependent on things like the population size of a species. This uh, process of biased gene conversion, the sort of consequences of it, will occur uh, much more readily in large populations. And that's because the bias in this process sort of mimics what we might think of as natural selection, sort of pushing the genome in that particular direction. I didn't want to get in too much detail about this process, but suffice it to say, there's a nice uh, review on this process uh, uh, in the last, um, just a very recent review. What you can see on these equations on the right is simply this bias, this B term, which you can see in these two equations, is modulated by this effective population size. And so again, we expect the consequences of this bias to operate more freely in big populations because genetic drift isn't sort of uh, thwarting it. It isn't working in, in the opposite direction. So, uh, and we'll come back to this idea because it's an interesting way in which the, the ecology of a species, at least sort of the, the, how big its populations are, can have some really interesting visible effects on the genome. <clears throat> now, uh, to digress yet again, I feel it's sort of a bit of a wandering path, but I want to tell you a little bit about our MHC studies, which uh, Jenny mentioned in her introduction, again, with regard to this issue of, of GC content. So MHC genes we've worked on for a long time, as Jenny mentioned, and in recent years we've been able to design a set of uh, primers uh, that amplify MHC genes in many different groups. This is just a schematic of what MHC genes do. Uh, you actually, there was an MHC uh, expression plot that I showed you a few slides earlier on the house finch. These are basically uh, receptors that um, bind onto pathogens and uh, sort of act as a surveillance mechanism for pathogens in uh, vertebrate hosts. Now, uh, these MHC genes have been of broad interest to people working in ecology because they're a nice link between uh, genetic variation on the one hand and the ability of individuals to uh, fight off pathogens on the other. So we've been able to design a pair of uh, PCR primers that allows us to amplify a particular group of MHC genes called class one genes in pretty much any songbird on the planet. So what you can see here is a tree of uh, a few hundred sequences that we've amplified from a variety of different songbirds that you see listed on the, the bottom. And so this is a really nice uh, resource because now we can really jump into any songbird population and begin to look at its, its uh, class one MHC variation. What I wanted to, to, to point out to you is this interesting pattern of GC content, which you see listed on the top. In this case, it's intriguing, whereas in the transcriptome study, we saw that the songbirds had a higher GC content. For these MHC genes, it turns out they actually have a somewhat lower GC content. And again, this may re relate to the pattern of recombination in these two different lineages. So uh, this is the kind of... Uh, pattern that we can see when we look at many different species for these genomic characteristics. Now, I might just skip over this slide. This is just a, a sort of a gee whiz, look at all the variation we found. But what's more important, I think, is this interesting pattern of selection in these two groups. 
we've here in this graph, we've basically measured the uh, extent of amino acid change in these MHC genes in the songbirds and the non-passerines. And what you can see by these green bars is just the huge, that, that the MHC genes of the songbirds are evolving much, much faster than what we see in the non-passerines. And so this is a really intriguing uh, sort of uh, macroevolutionary window into these two different uh, groups for these genes. Now to get back to this sort of uh, GC uh, relationship of G genomic and ecology traits, here's an interesting uh, image from a recent paper in which uh, the people were looking at GC content in different mammalian lineages. And what you can see here is that the sort of a hot uh, red lineages are very high GC lineages, whereas the uh, green lineages are low GC lineages. And you can see that there's a really intriguing variation as we look across different mammals. Much of this variation is thought to be driven by things like population size, other life history characteristics that are sort of influencing the ease with which these uh, genomic processes can operate. Now those of us in the bird world are dealing with a similarly big data set in which we have, thanks to the, uh, uh, the folks at the Beijing Genomics Institute, which seems to be doing the sequencing for all of us uh, these days, we have a remarkable uh, data set now consisting of about 50 bird genomes that we can begin to study these genomic processes. And what you see here on this slide is a sort of a, a first pass phylogenetic tree, in this case built from uh, sort of the exon component of that data. We're getting a lot of new insight into bird relationships, although I will say that uh, it's, there are a few branches in this tree that are still being recalcitrant even though we have almost full genomic data. So it's, it's a very intriguing, it's not as if more data will answer the question uh, unambiguously. But what I also wanted to point out to you is, again, this really interesting interplay with GC content and uh, sort of these different lineages. If we make a tree of this data set that, where we focus on genes that actually show a lot of GC variation among lineages, that's what you see here on the left. You can see the uh, red lineages, which are very high GC, and the yellow lineages, which are low GC. You can see that we get a very, uh, one particular phylogenetic tree, which is very different from the tree that we would get if we looked at genes that are varying relatively little in their GC content. That's what you see here on the right. And I, I put this up there, trust me, these trees are very different. They both suggest very different uh, relationships among birds. And I think it raises a bit of caution in terms of interpreting these very large data sets. Which genes will we use to build our trees? Will they have a lot of variation in GC among species or very little? These are the kinds of issues that we now begin to need to think about as we sort of uh, march through the genome with these bigger data sets. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, ongoing work that's been done by the uh, Avian Phylogenomics Consortium and um, hopefully uh, this, you'll, 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 you'll read about this sometime this year. It's been a very long, unwieldy project as uh, genome projects tend to be. <clears throat> so back to the house finches uh, after a very long digression. Uh, we've been able to use these uh, transcriptome data to answer some really cool questions about the relationship between uh, plumage variation on the one hand and uh, gene expression on the other. So these house finches are interesting because they come in two flavors, yellow birds and red birds. It turns out that the, uh, these are uh, pigments that are uh, uh, ingested essentially by the birds in the form of carotenoids. So the birds eat a lot of red berries and then they perform a number of metabolic tasks to convert this, these uh, red pigments into either yellowish or orangish uh, uh, pigments or uh, the typical red. Many of you are also probably aware that plumage brightness in birds is thought to be a badge of sorts, to sort of announce to the world or possibly other mates that uh, I have a particularly good immune system and I'm able to fight off disease. And that's what we would expect for red birds because they, they it turns out, are very favored by females. Uh, they tend to be the object of female choice. 
So we did an experiment where we infected both red and yellow birds with this mycoplasma pathogen, and we asked what the gene expression response was. This is work by our co main collaborator, uh, Jeff Hill, at the University of uh, Auburn in Alabama. And what you can see here is a really intriguing pattern where the yellow birds seem to be showing this pattern of downregulation, which we saw earlier in those Arizona birds. These, those were the birds that had not uh, seen the pathogen in nature. Whereas the red birds show a much less uh, dramatic pattern. Some of the genes go down, but um, most of them are sort of robust to this uh, infection. So uh, this is a case where the, the plumage may be some sort of indicator of the ability of these birds to uh, mount an expression response in response to these pathogens. So uh, this was work from the microarray on a relatively small sample of individuals. And what we did was we came back with a sort of quantitative PCR approach. And we um, looked at about 18 different genes. And we developed a simple principal component score for those genes. Anyway, basically, this chart is, is telling a similar story, wherein the uh, red birds are showing a very different uh, expression profile after infection than are the uh, yellow birds. You can see we've got control birds on the left. And for both the first and the second principal components of these uh, 18 or so genes, we're seeing a very different response between these two groups of birds. So this is a, a, an intriguing finding that we'd like to follow up with, with more studies in the wild uh, looking at uh, geographic variation. Now, I'd like to end by uh, telling you a little bit about how we're extending this house finch system into a broader uh, temporal and geographic uh, scale. And so as I, as I indicated to you before, we're very fortunate to have uh, a number of um, sort of temporal resources for this house finch system. We've got a large number of birds sampled from before the uh, uh, epizootic in the 1980s. And we also have ongoing collections of populations that have been exposed to the pathogen for uh, different amounts of time. Longer periods in the east where the pathogen started, uh, and some populations, such as in the southwest, which still haven't uh, been exposed to the pathogen in nature. So what we're doing now is we're uh, using the rad tag approach, which I explained earlier in terms of the, 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 the flycatcher system, to look at the pattern of allele frequency change, both across geography, sort of horizontally, as well as across time, uh, with the hypothesis that this uh, epizootic caused by the mycoplasma might be causing shifts in allele frequencies at key genes uh, involved with uh, the evolution of disease resistance. Now, um, we, in the first uh, brief uh, study, I'll tell you, that's uh, the sort of geographic study. We'll look at that same transcriptome data set and look at some of the allele frequency patterns that we're seeing between the Arizona and, and uh, Alabama populations. And then in the second example I'll show you, we'll be looking um, across time at uh, SNPs that across the genome that we've measured using rad tags comparing the sort of uh, recent post-epizootic birds to the pre-epizootic birds. So again, I think I'll skip this slide. This is some of the statistics from our transcriptome study showing that there's quite a lot of amino acid variation in these uh, transcripts. This uh, x-axis is simply sort of a measure of the ratio of amino acid changes. So quite a lot of uh, significant functional variation going on. This is just explaining FST, which I probably should have done at the beginning of the talk since I've used it. But hopefully, it's been clear to you that what we're looking for in both of these studies are uh, high FST. So this is a situation when FST is close to 1, where allele frequencies have shifted quite a lot, either between geographic populations or across uh, time. When we see an FST of 0, that means that populations are basically similar in terms of their allele frequencies and the frequencies of these uh, SNPs. So in this first result, what we'll do is we'll look at the uh, allele frequency spectrum in the Arizona and Alabama populations to see what kinds of differences that we can find. And this is what we see. 
you can see we have FST listed here on the uh, x-axis. And we see that the majority of the uh, transcripts are showing relatively little differentiation. And this, of course, is what we would expect for a very uh, mixed uh, species that doesn't have a lot of uh, taxonomic uh, substructuring in it. Like many, like many of the surveys we've done, most of the variation is, is spread across the entire species. However, we do find a subset of loci at the tail of this distribution which are showing much stronger levels of differentiation. And we're currently looking at the identities of these genes to see whether they might have an interesting story to tell in terms of the evolution of resistance in these different populations. Now, in the next slide, what I'll show you is a very similar plot, but this time looking across time between the pre- and post-epizootic birds. Now, what you can see again is a, a relatively uh, low level of FST. We even have some negatives here, which those are basically indistinguishable from zero. So you can see that for most of the genome, the average FST is 0 .006, so it's not even worth batting an eye over. This is really nothing interesting going on. However, if we look at this tail of the distribution, again, this is sort of expanded out, we see a really intriguing number of SNPs that are showing very large frequency shifts between this, the uh, pre and post uh, epizootic populations. And now what we're also doing is looking at these uh, same profiles in populations uh, sampled across the same time period where there had been no disease. That's a very important control. We, we want to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, attributing these shifts to uh, an incorrect uh, source. Our preliminary data suggests that the number of SNPs we're finding here is indeed significant and could uh, really be showing us some interesting trends. And so uh, this is work done by my graduate student, Allison Schultz, and for this exciting result, she gets a wow. This is really exciting, and um, uh, she'll be presenting some of this work at the uh, evolution meetings this summer uh, in, uh, in Utah. So I hope this ride hasn't been too diverse. Uh, we've got lots of projects going on, but I hope I've uh, uh, sort of illustrated for you the many ways in which next generation data sets are sort of changing our view of genomic variation in natural populations. Uh, everything from our sampling schemes, certainly to the bioinformatics we're using, is influenced by the, the large number of loci that we can now look at. <coughs> These large data sets are opening our eyes to some genomic forces that we may not have considered before. And so things like GC content may be showing some really interesting patterns that are correlating with ecology and, and might be influencing the way in which we analyze these data sets, such as the phylogenetic analyses. And then finally, this uh, looking at uh, using these next-gen data sets to look for these so-called uh, FST outliers, the, the SNPs that are showing lots of differentiation when the bulk of the genome is showing relatively little variation, these, I think, are going to be really important um, ways to look for genes that are uh, experiencing natural selection in the wild. There are lots of exciting things to look forward to. These are some of the folks that have uh, contributed to uh, this, uh, all of this research, and I'm very much looking to have a few questions. So thank you very much. <clears throat> I just ask about the northern and southern flycatchers. Do they interbreed? Do they have fertile offspring? Right. The question was about the northern and southern flycatchers. Um, as you can see, they're, they're disjunct, right? So they're not really abutting. That mosaic population is actually closer to the northern population than to the southern one. So, you know, we, that's one thing that our limited sampling can't tell us, right? We've sampled only a few individuals. So we don't really know about um, high, we don't really know about uh, whether there are geographic intermediates in those areas. The ranges that you see that you saw there are are probably reasonably accurate. Um, we don't really know yet whether the hybrids that they're producing would be viable or not. That's I mean conceivably we could do those sorts of experiments, but uh, who knows how uh, 
South American flycatcher would do in a you know in a in a in a cap captive setting, but um, but that's uh, uh, the gene flow that we we detected. I think um, you would predict that some of those hybrids probably are living because if, if they all were if they all were not doing well, we wouldn't that signal would be greatly diminished. And so my prediction is that those hybrids would be doing okay, but that they might be doing less well than the, the regular uh, matings within the species. Hey, thanks for the um, great talk. I've got a question. You, you had, um, when you showed kind of the differences between having um, a few individuals and lots of genes versus having lots of individuals and less genes, and you said, okay, they tell different um, stories, wouldn't be, and it's not clear yet what, what you, questions can you answer with these two different approaches. Isn't it kind of obvious if you have lots of individuals and lots of genes that that would be the kind of the golden bullet to have? Yes, yes, that's a, I mean, that's a very good point. And I think, I mean, I think the point about, you know, how many individuals do we look at, it's, it's, it's sort of just a, a reminder, I would say. I think in phylogeography, there's often been a tendency uh, to sort of, um, you know, look at perhaps broader numbers of species, broader numbers of individuals, almost at the expense of more genes. And um, for those of you who know me, I've, I've uh, you know, I've always tried to just to remind the community that, you know, uh, that's not necessarily the only way to, to get at these sorts of questions. I think now you're absolutely right. We're in a position where we don't have to make these choices. And I think we could, um, the, the gold standard would indeed be looking at lots of individuals for lots of genes. The, the real question is what are we gaining by looking at lots of individuals? And I think in some cases we'll gain a lot. Uh, we'll look at new populations. We can look at really at fine scale geography. Those are all really important. But for many of the really major events in species histories, it's often not clear what more individuals are going to give us. And so this, I think we need more, more studies to look at this. Um, and of course, you know, for example, the Neanderthal studies, they used, you know, one genome, two genomes to make what many would say are fairly detailed, you know, uh, uh, scenarios of hybridization and this and that. I'm sure these scenarios will be revised, but um, it's sort of just a reminder. And I think I, I agree with you completely, though, that uh, we should just push, push the envelope on both axes for sure. Uh, yes, thank you again for that great talk. Um, my question is about the yellow and red finches. Um, from a biochemical point of view, do you have any idea what the metabolites are doing to affect the immune system? And is there any selection for or against either colour observed in the population at all? That's a, those are great questions. Yeah, I mean, it's so there's a bit known about carotenoid metabolism in songbirds. Um, you know, you can grind up feathers and sort of s split apart the different components um, on uh, chromatograms. Um, there is little known, however, about the actual enzymes that are causing, that are, uh, you know, modulating the, uh, the conversions. It's actually a really hot topic. I think there's a bunch of people around the world trying to find these, uh, which, what are the genes and enzymes that are actually converting the carotenoids they get from nature to the ones they deposit in their feathers. Now, you know, we know from a lot of the work that Jeff Hill has done, we know that uh, red birds are pretty much favored. He's very much a, a fan of the sort of good genes model of sexual selection where um, bright plumage is an indicator of uh, superior quality. Um, you know, the fact that there's such a large environmental component to this color may mean that uh, this sort of quality influences the, the access that birds have to carotenoids. Um, but it's, it's complicated. I mean, there's geographic variation. There tends to be a lot more um, yellow birds in the west. Um, I don't think I mentioned, but the, the eastern birds are all derived from uh, uh, human introductions, actually, in the last uh, 40 years. And so, um, you know, the uh, there is evidence in nature for different disease resistance ability based on plumage, but sort of the fine scale, what's modulating the geographic variation, we still don't, don't know very well. It's so. a quick one. Um, I was interested in the analysis that you had using genome-wide SNPs to infer the effective population size oh, yeah. over time. And I was just wondering how you actually got that sort of time scale aspect to the study and whether it was based on a molecular clock or right. how you did that. Right, so that, that was uh, 
I sh I, there was a paper I showed uh, by uh, Lee and Durbin who were using the um, single individuals to reconstruct human history. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you know you have to make an assumption about the generation time of humans. I think they used 25 years, um, and you you also it, you know this sort of analysis could be influenced by differences in mutation rate in different genes, and so that's another variable. Um, they found in that study that uh, you know the main patterns they found were pretty robust assumptions about those those methods. But I think um, uh, you know whether or not different lineages, whether or not, for example, the species has to be sort of evolving at the same rate across the time period. I think my, my suspicion is that when the time frame is that short, you know, the last hundred thousand years or, or so, shifts in rate probably don't result in a big uh, a, a big a big change. But um, uh, you know how deep in history we could actually go with these approaches is is not clear. I think that's um, that's a it, that's a really interesting question. We just we just don't know that yet. Humans, I think, are the only species for which that particular analysis has been done. <laughs>